Burma's opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi has hailed a new era for her country. It's been one final day of election campaigning here in Pakistan. Kosovo's Albanians finally break free from a century of Serbian rule. Democracy has to deliver. People want to vote and eat. The last moments of Muammar Gaddafi, the last moments of a dictator. Ultimately, a more democratic world is a more peaceful and prosperous place. South Sudan has now formally declared its independence. We may not know where and when brave people will claim their rights next, but it's a safe bet that NDI is there now because freedom knows no better champion. From the very beginning, NDI had a strong belief that uh, democracy was a universal principle and that people around the world um, had uh, the same hopes and aspirations. And we decided that our mission was to teach about the nuts and bolts of democracy, not to have an ideological bent, and to teach them about the fact that democracy is not an event, it's a process. So we look at how political development and economic development go together, and that's often a challenge. One could argue that this is the most transformational time we've seen in history uh, for centuries, if not longer. And I think the essence of that transformation is around technology, the fact that we're moving to an integrated society around the world. And that integration requires a lot more understanding about institutions of good governance. That's what NDI is all about. People are in a demanding mood. And the question is, what is the responsibility of the international community? I think the Arab Spring happened in part because people were ready for real change. They understood that all of the repression, all of the tyranny that they had experienced wasn't necessarily in their future if they could come together and, and, and find ways with which to demonstrate their desire that a country could be better. We were on the ground in Tunisia two days after President Ben Ali had resigned, responding to their requests for the type of assistance that would be relevant in the Tunisian context. We brought in experts, political practitioners, uh, civic activists from around the world to share their experiences in democratic transitions. And when there was a political impasse in 2013, uh, we were able to work with political parties to help them uh, articulate their negotiating positions and to identify areas of compromise. I think there's little doubt that without the institutions of governance, you'll never have the governance to which people aspire. So really it was critical that both go hand in glove, an understanding of the importance of the institutions, but the institution building that must come with it. NDI's role has been absolutely invaluable. Many people are speaking to their governments on 21st century technology. The governments, many of them, are listening on 20th century technology and unfortunately sometimes responding with 19th century ideas. So there is a disconnect. This is a great challenge for democracy going forward. And we at NDI not only have in-house expertise and technology experts, but we're also partnering with technology companies in Silicon Valley to help governments, help citizens, help political leaders, and help legislatures utilize technology to solve problems. 
I think the, the opportunity for technology uh, with respect to democratic development is really to enable people around the world to have a voice in the political process uh, and in how their governing institutions serve them. I think we're learning from each other, um, those that are in the business and those of us that are in the democracy uh, world, is how to uh, maximize the opportunities that the new technology really gives. I think people might be surprised at the work we do with women. I don't think they probably know the extent of our work. When I was Secretary of State, um, I felt that societies would be better off if women were politically and economically empowered. We work to support women candidates, support them uh, when they are in parliaments, and try to encourage more women to take uh, part in it. We're seeing a lot more of a, an opportunity for women to play major roles. Given that opportunity, they're advancing the leadership and the potential for meaningful change in countries all over, especially in the developing world. Kenya's election was largely peaceful, avoiding the ethnic killings and violence which marred the 2007 poll. The presidential elections in Mali have marked the end of one of the bloodiest periods in the country's history. I think that democracy is a process and it's a difficult one. There are many, many challenges and many opportunities and that's why the work that NDI does is so important. People think these processors are about getting everyone to agree. They're not. They're about getting everyone to behave respectfully with each other and find ways of disagreeing without killing each other. I think NDI's work is very instrumental in Sudan. Um, a lot of politicians and a lot of uh, government officials have really praised what NDI has been doing. So I think they should keep up the good work. If we have learned anything uh, since 1983 is that there is a common humanity. We do this work not because it serves the interests of the United States and it serves the interests of other countries. We do this work because it's the right thing to do. everybody. Welcome to this dinner. If I could ask you to pause just for a minute and give us your attention, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Catty Kay from the BBC and I'd like to welcome you to the National Democracy Institute's 2013 Democracy Award Dinner. We are thrilled, of course, to have all of you here in person. There are people who are also watching on live stream and we would like to welcome them as well to this event. Thank you all for joining us. Today the world paused to remember a very great man. He was warm and funny and he was forgiving and he was a true champion of democracy. On the day that Nelson Mandela walked out of prison in February the 11th, 1990, we didn't know that reconciliation would be possible. I was in the square in Cape Town that day and the crowd was giddy with jubilation, but they were also tense. We didn't know what the future would be. We knew that South Africa's past was behind us. We didn't know what the future was br would bring. Four years later, South Africa held its first democratic elections and NDI was there at the very heart of the process. NDI arrived in South Africa in 1991 and along with a partner organization on the ground set up the processes for that election. You set up Project Vote, reaching out to churches and schools, old people's homes, spreading the message of democracy in 10 different languages. When the election finally arrived, all of the hard work paid off. It was an almost flawless ballot, less than 1% of the votes were considered unvalid. That peaceful, open, historic election with a transfer of power from the minority to the majority, 
that had been unimaginable just a few years beforehand set the stage for South Africa's long walk to freedom. It is a fitting day to pay tribute to an organization that was only a few years old at the time when Mandela took his first steps out of Victor Forster prison, but helped achieve a miracle. Today, the NDI is 30 years old and we say happy birthday. Tonight, we will be hearing from some remarkable people who will reflect on NDI's work as well as the future of democracy to mark this very special occasion. We encourage you to discuss and to follow this event online. Of course, this is an evening about technology and democracy. The hashtag for the event on Twitter is NDI30. And for those of you, by the way, who haven't already purchased a raffle ticket, please, please do so. I saw the car on the way in. It is a fabulous pale blue Fiat 500. I'd like it for myself. <laughs> Buy those raffle tickets. You could be the lucky winner tonight, and staff will be circulating during the dinner to make sure you buy the ticket. With that, please, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to help me invite to the stage Someone who really needs no introduction tonight, the former Secretary of State and NDI Chairman, Madeleine Albright. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Caddy, and good evening to everybody. Uh, we have assembled to um, celebrate NDI's 30th anniversary which is, uh, by a happy and entirely appropriate coincidence, also Human Rights Day. Uh, I would like to say we're changing the program a little bit because Samantha Power, Ambassador Power, was kind of held up on the train. She will be arriving, uh, and we will uh, have our program slightly uh, changed in terms of order. Uh, I am so delighted to see so many friends and to join with you in applauding President Ilves and Jack Dorsey and our entire list of honored guests. Tonight, we are placing the spotlight on an extraordinary group of innovators who personify the intersection between new technology and the dem democratic pro uh, process. As we celebrate leaders who have dedicated their lives to furthering democracy, as Caddy said, it's only fitting that we take a moment to reflect on the life and legacy of President Nelson Mandela. I have to say I did have the honor of meeting President Mandela when I first became ambassador of the United Nations, and this man walked up and he said, hello, I'm Nelson Mandela, like well, you wouldn't know. Uh, so, <clears throat> and then I had the opportunity to meet him again in South Africa with the leopard on my shoulder. Uh, the passing of Nelson Mandela is deeply saddening, and our thoughts and prayers are with his family and with the people of South Africa whom he loved. and served so well. We often say of famous figures that their words and works will survive them. In this case, it happens to be true. President Mandela was an activist, a prisoner of conscience, a political leader, and a venerated statement, statesman, but he was above all a teacher. He taught us that the power of forgiveness is greater than the power of hate, and that differences of race and nationality matter less than our shared humanity. And these lessons are simple to articulate, but require immense wisdom and courage to implement. President Mandela's strength as a teacher is that he not only advised us what to do, he showed us how. And personally, I will treasure the memory of our meetings, the directness of his talk, the warmth of his smile, and the depth of his commitment to the economic and social well-being of his people. President Mandela leaves behind a globe in which the mere mention of his name inspires um, faith that injustice can be ended and conflicts resolved through respect for the dignity of every human being. And that's why the best way to honor President Mandela is not merely to mourn him, but to follow his example. And while we mourn his passing, we can take comfort in the fact that his lessons and legacy will live through the work of organizations such as the National Democratic Institute. 
Before I, I really begin my remarks, I want to acknowledge our board of directors and express my appreciation to them. Their experience and judgment are a constant uh, source of uh, happiness and resources and every way support for this organization. And I'm also very pleased to recognize my predecessors as chairman of NDI, the late Chuck Manat, Vice President Walter Mondale, and Senator Paul Kirk, who is here with us this evening. All of us at NDI strive to carry forward their vision and achievements. There's one person who is sadly missing tonight, and that's Gene Eidenberg, who passed away last week after a long illness. He served on NDI's board of directors for 23 years, and during his tenure, Gene brought to the Institute his great intellect, passion for politics, and a deep and abiding commitment to the democratic cause and to NDI. Gene had many friends in this room from his time at the White House and MCI and the Democratic Party, and we will miss him dearly. And our thoughts and prayers are with Gene's wife, Anna, and the entire family. Three decades of life for NDI means almost three decades at NDI for Ken Wallach, our fearless and inflappable leader uh, who has seen it all and still greets each new day with the question, what can NDI do to help democracy succeed? As the years go by, the answer to that question has constantly evolved. And Ken has been there in helping in every single way, and I treasure him as a partner in all the efforts to bring democracy. Ken, without you, none of this would be happening. When NDI began, the Berlin Wall still stood, and people still died trying to cross it. Single party systems were common, and sham elections were the norm. In the West, there was only nascent recognition of democracy as a component of foreign policy. Since then, the fall of communism, the outbreak of ethnic violence, the rise of terrorist threats, and the turbulence of financial markets have all drastically altered the global landscape. Some suggest that democratic forces have lost ground, but the truth is that we concern ourselves more and more with helping democracy to succeed in places where, until recently, it didn't exist. That is progress, but also a challenge to do much more, and it's been my privilege to be part of the leadership of NDI for most of the past three decades. I took a little bit of time out to do something else. And I'm proud that since its founding, the Institute has met many challenges and remained a consistent leading international force for democracy. Going forward, we are determined to profit from what we've learned and to continue adapting to change circumstances and events. Being in the democracy business, we're aware that technology is key to that change, affecting how officials and activists count votes, organize political movements, develop policy ideas, and debate the issues that shape our lives. Accordingly, in partnership with donors and tech companies, NDI has itself become an innovator. Literally millions of trained election monitors can now use new technologies that allow their SMS messages to be transmitted accurately and securely. NSA. Um, uh, 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 um, parliaments can open their data in a way that helps citizens access and analyze information about legislation and the work of their representatives. Social media can monitor political trends and track hate speeches to assess the potential for violence. And in closed societies, technology tools allow human rights and democracy activists to communicate online safely and securely. And that's part of our focus tonight. Social media has empowered citizens and democratic activists in the Arab world and elsewhere to connect, organize, and disseminate information. The connection between technology and democracy has become embedded in our language, evidenced by the fact that we now refer to democratic uprisings from Moldova to Iran to Tunisia to Egypt as Twitter revolutions. 
Yet we know that it is often easier to spark a revolution than to sustain it. And as I've often said, the road from Tahrir Square to governance is neither straight nor short. These days, citizens are demanding to have say in their self-government more than every two or four years at election time. They expect their local and national governments to listen and respond to them at the speed of the internet. Part of the problem is due simply to information overload, as governments and citizens alike are now faced with a daily avalanche of information. The challenge is the so-called signal-to-noise ratio. How do we sort the meaningful information from everything else? But it also runs deeper than that. As we all seek to filter massive amounts of information available to us, there's a risk that we filter out information that doesn't reconfirm our existing viewpoints, running the risk of further polarizing political discourse. And despite the impact of technology on political organizing, many democratic institutions, which by their nature are often slow to change, are still in the process of adapting to the digital age. It has been said, and I repeat this often, that citizens are speaking to their governments using 21st century technology, while governments listen with 20th century technology and respond with 19th century ideas. <laughs> Which is why it's so important that we recognize individuals who are using technology to help governments and citizens engage in new ways to solve problems and why the theme of technology and civic innovation is especially appropriate this evening. In the past, NDI normally recognized a gathering such as this, an individual democratic leader from abroad. These reflected the times when democratic leadership was fighting to emerge from under the weight of autocracy or from sectarian conflict. Now the times demand that we also acknowledge new forces for empowerment, individuals and organizations that are using technologies that simply did not exist a generation ago, a decade ago, or even last year. Every day, there are new examples of how technology can help improve citizens' ability to engage with their representatives, make government more transparent and accountable, and empower citizens and governments to collaborate to solve problems. The innovators we're honoring this evening are pioneers in these areas, connecting people in places ranging from Afghanistan to Tanzania to Mexico and the United States. They're innovators who have thought hard about how to use technology to help their citizens communicate better with their governments and with each other, and to enable individuals with good ideas to share those insights quickly and globally. NDI is really proud to be working with many of our honorees as they help democratic institutions take advantage of technology to enable new forms of interaction between governments and citizens. So tonight, you'll be able to hear a few of their stories. Their work reaffirms NDI's core mission of helping to spread democratic learning across borders regions, and continents. Democracy faces a range of challenges today, from sectarian violence to terrorism to the turbulence of financial markets. Yet when I look at the depth and breadth of civic innovation around the world and the passion and dedication of our honorees this evening, I'm confident in the future of democracy and the work that NDI does, and our mission remains very much on the right side of history. This is because I believe that NDI and the innovators reflect the hopes and aspirations of people everywhere. Thank you so very much. Good evening. Um, I am Ken Wallach, president of NDI, and I too want to welcome you uh, to our celebration of the 213 uh, Averill Harriman Democracy Award. Thank you all for not taking the weather forecasters too seriously. <laughs> uh, for those who must be suffering from Kayana phobia, and that is the fear of snow, 
which is so prevalent in the nation's capital, and could not join us tonight, uh, there will be no home delivery of the chicken. <laughs> the people-to-people -people nature of our work has been greatly expanded in recent years, as the Secretary said, to include online tools to impart knowledge, share ideas, and to connect people and groups. We know that as the community of democracies has grown, democratic practice has become inseparable from democratic cooperation. The 21 recipients of tonight's award come from 11 countries. Their innovations are a demonstration that information technology is changing how we connect and the way we cooperate. You will be hearing from some of the recipients in a panel discussion later, but I would like to acknowledge all 21 civic innovators and ask those who are with us to stand and to be recognized. And their extraordinary work is summarized in your program. Like Madeline, I would also like to recognize NDI's Board of Directors, whose leadership, commitment, and generosity are central to the Institute's efforts. And I would like to give a shout out to those who are here tonight and ask them to stand. Tom Daschle, Elizabeth Bagley, Patty Babbitt, Peter Kovler, Howard Dean, Linda Thomas, Maurice Templesman, Bren Simon, Rob Libertor, Robin Carnahan, Johnny Carson, Rochelle Horowitz, Rye Barcott, Susie George, Maureen White, Nancy Rubin, Joan Kalambukitis, Bernie Aronson, Mike Steed, and our counsel Rusty Connor. As you know, Madeleine Albright was the Institute's founding vice chair 30 years ago, and after a couple of obscure government posts, she returned as chairman 13 years ago. And her leadership on behalf of NDI has contributed measurably to our reach and standing in so many ways. Thank you, Madeleine. With us tonight are board members and staff of the National Endowment for Democracy and our three affiliated institutes, IRI, the Solidarity Center, and SITE. We are proud members of the NED family. We are not alone in our democratic development mission. We are part of a community that includes groups both here and abroad. Each of us benefits from our mutual support. Some of those groups are here this evening. They include IFAS, Freedom House, Internews, the UNDP, the ABA, and the ICNL. We are honored by the presence of members and staff of the Senate and House. The Congress has always been and remains an inspiration to democratic activists around the world. And it has also given indispensable support for democracy promotion efforts. We are grateful that officials from the White House, the State Department, and USAID are with us. They represent our support network and our allies in the field. At its heart, NDI represents a public-private partnership, so I want to especially single out those who made this evening possible, the corporations, trade unions, foundations, and individual donors. Each of them has been listed in your program and has appeared on the screens here. I want to welcome members of the Diplomatic Corps who are here tonight, and I would like to express our gratitude to those in this room and thousands of others around the globe who have volunteered their time and expertise to assist NDI's efforts. Finally, I want to recognize NDI's Vice President, Sherry Bryan. And the entire staff, those who are here, 
as well as their colleagues in the field. These men and women representing 100 nationalities are on the front line of our work, sharing practical skills and engaging local leaders and activists. They are inspired by the courage and the persistence of our local partners. In her introduction of Ambassador Power, Madeleine Albright will note that she and the ambassador share a number of personal attributes. The same could be said about Madeleine and President Ilvis. Both were immigrants whose families fled the communists. Both grew up in the United States. Both became professors. And both are known for a piece of apparel. Secretary Albright for her pins and President Ilvis for his bow ties. <laughs> President Ilvis, however, returned to Estonia to become the head of state. Madeleine rebuffed efforts to draft her for the presidency of the Czech Republic. <laughs> and as a result of Section 2 of the US Constitution, she had to settle for being a successor to Thomas Jefferson in one of his earlier government jobs, not his last. Under the leadership of President Ilvis, who learned computer programming at the age of 13, Estonia has been called the most connected country on earth. It even has an online persona, Estonia, the digital society. <laughs> A quarter of Estonians now vote online. An online platform, the People's Assembly, allows citizens to submit proposals to lawmakers. Every citizen over 15 years of age receives what the president calls a personal access key, similar to a SIM card. There are 330 services available to key holders, including access to medical records and personal tax information. The card can be used to fill out a prescription at the pharmacy, ride a bus, or cross the country's borders. All this in a nation that, after 50 years of Soviet occupation, had an infrastructure level of the 1930s. The success of their technological advances, however, is based on more than know-how. It is grounded in a democratic system in which citizens have trust in their government. And government data, increasingly accessible to Estonians, has become a catalyst of transparency, public integrity, economic growth, and innovation. While President Ilvis has demonstrated how technology can be used for good, he has not hesitated to raise technology's darker side and the need for vigilance. Estonia, after all, was the victim of major cyber attacks from its powerful neighbor. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present President Thomas Hendrik Ilvis and recognize his achievements as a public servant, a political leader, a builder of democracy, and an innovator, a driving force behind the movement of civic life onto the internet. Mr. President. Thank you, Ken. Dear Madeline, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd just like to say how honored I am to be honored by you on your 30th anniversary, though it is somewhat depressing to know that I'm almost exactly the twice, <laughs> twice the age of this organization. On the other hand, I feel like I've known it my entire life. I will talk a little bit about the dark or darker side, but in the beginning, let me just say, first of all, every time I speak before an American audience, I always like to begin, uh, or at least have for, the, for three years, congratulated the United States for its position in the Internet Freedom Index put out by F Freedom House. There's another plug for Mr. Kramer. Um, uh, congratulate the United States for being second. Uh, <laughs> This year, however, I'm sad to say the United States has fallen to number three, but we fall into number two in Estonia because Iceland squeaked by us. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it is always good to be among countries or in a country where internet freedom is 
is ranked at the top and where people understand these issues. In my own country, uh, which I'll talk about a little, uh, we really have based our, our progress from, uh, from what was a backward former Soviet Republic that really had uh, very little uh, very little to do with the 21st century or even the 20th century when we became independent to one of the most wired countries in the world, as Ken just said. Uh, that was a conscious decision. Initially, it was, it was really uh, a decision of desperation to move ahead, to make a leap, to get out of where we were. And it was just to make things more efficient, more transparent, and more open. But as we as we proceeded and as we brought more and more services and more and more aspects of life online, we began to see how much we could use the, the e-services to actually promote democracy, to promote transparency and openness in government, to allow citizens to participate, uh, and also to see um, to foster and create absolutely new and fundamental innovations in civ civil society, so that uh, ranging from things which can refer to the uh, we you can, we have in Estonia actually a mechanism by which citizens propose legislation um, to the parliament, uh, which is. Uh, doing it online and going through what uh, a process developed by, uh, uh, by James Fishkin at Stanford on a deliberative democracy, which we've done online and then uh, moved in the direction of getting parliament to actually have direct inputs. On the civic society side, perhaps some of you have heard of an organization that um, actually now works in about 100 countries. It's called Let's Do It World. It's a cleanup campaign that was invented by, in Estonia by, by uh, two guys from Skype who are also, Skype is also from Estonia, uh, and the, uh, by which uh, we cleaned up a lot of garbage in our country, so, and everyone did it voluntarily after the Skype guys invented an app which they put on smartphones by which you could, where you could find by GPS locate garbage and then people would know where to go and then we got another IT company to do, figure out the logistics. So we see that using technology you can actually do all kinds of things that before were very difficult because cleanup campaigns are as, uh, at least 50 years old but they never really worked and now they've caught on in about 100 countries using this technology. A couple of things that we have done, which I'll just say briefly, with, <coughs> that uh, you do need to do if you want to move ahead in this world, is that uh, the fundamental issue of anything relating to IT is identity. You will recall the, uh, perhaps, the New Yorker cartoon of two dogs, one in front of a computer and <coughs> saying to the other, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. <laughs> that. The problem is that it's, it's a joke, but it's not funny. The problem is that is the fundamental problem of what the internet is about, and that is what uh, you don't know who it is that's contacting you or is looking at your numbers or your figures or, or anything. So identity is key, and, uh, and, uh, and I think this is one of the problems that, uh, that the United States will have to face is uh, coming to terms with actually having a, a, a rigorous uh, and secure identity, which people are against here for various reasons, similar to opposition to gun control laws, I think. One of the other things that we did that is crucial and fundamental is that the citizen is the owner of his or her own data and has a right to see whoever is accessing those data. Uh, that is what allows trust in a government that actually uses uh, IT to the degree that we have. Uh, and we also, uh, we also have a law which says you, the government may only ask you for any bit of data once. N it can, once you've given the government your address, for example, you never have to fill out your address again. Once, once you... <laughs> it actually makes life much more difficult for the government, but it, what it does do is it, uh, it eases, uh, it eases the, uh, or reduces the friction of 
bureaucracy, and it also allows, to, uh, I mean, uh, allows people to feel more comfortable using all of the IT services that we offer. I said all that just, just to prove that I'm not a Luddite, because the rest of my time I'd like to talk about some of the things that we worry about. Uh, uh, just a, so a few remarks on democracy, freedom, and our information age. Those of you who are old enough to remember, recall that in the 90s, Marshall McLuhan wrote about how we all lived in a global village. Uh, that was in the television age when um, we could see events such as the Vietnam War in, on our TV sets and they were brought home. But it was an incomplete metaphor because it wasn't a village then. We could see what was happening elsewhere uh, based on what the editors of the television program or the censors in authoritarian societies decided we could see. Uh, but unlike in a real village, no one really was following you. And no one knew anything about you. But the emergence of the internet has changed this. Today, we truly live in a village. Anyone, anywhere can know as much, if not more, about you as, uh, as a, a hundred years ago, only a hundred people in your village knew about you. Uh, my grandfather was a, uh, was a child in a small peasant, in a small farming village in Estonia. Uh, only the neighbors knew anything about him. Today, where he living today, everyone would know everything about him if they wanted to. This is a trivial empirical truth, but consider also that in the past 150 years, hundreds of millions have fled from the village, from the shtetl, to cities, to other countries, to the new world, some to escape poverty, others uh, others to escape political oppression, or if you <coughs> think back of the Bildungsromans of the first half of the past century, to es escape the small town world where everyone, in fact, did know everything about you. Well, there is no such thing anymore as a clean start. You will always be open to being investigated. Just a few keystrokes and everyone will know everything they might want to know about you. And I'm not talking about a government agency. Today we are, thanks to modern technology, back, truly back in the village. Thanks to governments, Google, apps you've downloaded in your smartphone, your credit card swipes, you are an open book and more of an open book than anyone has ever been. And this, this will have and already has had a profound, has had profound implications for what we consider liberal democracy and privacy two fundamental elements uh, that were given to us during the Enlightenment. Ladies and gentlemen, most of what constitutes the basis of modern liberal democracy actually has a short history of only four centuries. Thomas Hobbes pa posed the problem of the anarchy of life in a state of nature and the war of all against all. John Locke provided the theoretical solution of a contract between the government and the people. It has been tested, retested, refined in practice and in theory. The Peter Zenger trial 250 years ago, Voltaire, the Federalist Papers, Thomas Paine, John Stuart Mill, with refinements by Isaiah Berlin in two concepts of liberty and by others. For this night's purpose, it is important to stress that while the world has gone through immense challenges and changes, the industrializations, the space age, the advance of mass communication, radio and television, we successfully until now have squared the circle of liberal democracy and progress, especially technological progress. We will do so again, but these are more difficult times and challenges. When the thinker and Grateful Dead lyricist John Perry Barlow addressed governments in 1996 in his declaration of the independence of the internet saying, and I quote, your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us, unquote. He was right, he also left out privacy, but more right than we unfortunately bargained for because in this age of the internet, we are back in a Hobbesian state of nature. All too often we are in a war of all against all. Surveillance of the kind described as strictly fictional, the two-way television of 1948, 1948, 1984 by Orwell, is now in every computer, unless you tape your PC's camera, 
mobile phones or microphones. They also inform others where you are at any time. Big data knows and can deduce more about you than Big Brother ever did. And all this even without the state. Individuals and companies can do all of this. It's just that the state can do it better. As Rebecca McKinnon and Yevgeny Moros have chillingly demonstrated, authoritarian states can and do use IT every bit as well as democracies without the restrictions imposed on their use in liberal democracies and do so to deprive their citizens of rights more effectively than they have in the past. And today, we are all in the midst of a massive debate on what liberal democracies can, should, and should not do with the extremely powerful technologies that we all now possess. Concepts such as privacy, confidentiality, and freedom of speech, especially anonymous speech, must be addressed in a new way because all of them have been redefined and indeed through technology have redefined themselves. Where precisely the legal concepts, to use Barlow's use of the term, that underpin liberal democracy truly no longer <coughs> necessarily apply to us, whoever that may be, or to, to they need not apply to you, or they need not apply to the mafia, or to the, to a, <clears throat> to an authoritarian regime, or to the government, or kids under the age, legal age of responsibility. Do fundamental concepts such as what constitutes reasonable search and seizure, seizure apply to bits? Is a DDoS attack a legitimate form of social protest? What is identity, as I asked uh, in the beginning, when, we when even a dog can be on the internet? Who owns the data created each time you make a credit card swipe or log your morning push-ups or your driving route is passively recorded by your mobile telephone transmission towers on the way to work or anywhere else? What happens when you enter a bus and someone wears Google glasses that recognize who you are? And what about authoritarian societies where no democratic rights and freedoms apply? where the ability to restrict and modify and distort information is being taken to new and unprecedented levels where virtually <clears throat> virtual reality has an altogether different meaning. These are all questions I won't and in most cases cannot answer. A and I could go on posing them. But I mention even these just to point out that many of the self-evident truths underlying liberal democracy must be reinterpreted in the internet age. They must be readdressed. Today, 1984 and Brave New World, the classic dystopian novels I read in high school that were so formative in our thinking about liberal democracies strike, I think, everyone as technologically naive in their assumptions. Or, I remember as a 10-year-old reading The Three Musketeers where the three of them are sitting around looking, burning a piece of paper and they said, well, let's, just, let's also throw the ashes out in case Richelieu has figured out how to read, read ashes. Um, well, today we cannot reconstitute ashes just as uh, Richelieu could not, but we can reconstitute the message. And uh, that's pretty scary. We are only beginning to figure out what freedom is online. We even have a coalition of countries defending it, though it's not at all clear everyone, everyone knows what it is. Uh, and I will, the day after tomorrow in London, begin chairing a group of private and public organizations and thinkers to figure out how we should proceed um, with ICANN. Uh, and where we also feel, ever since the Snowden revelations, a renewed pressure by authoritarian regimes to participate more actively in internet governance. And we must be honest with ourselves, for in my part of the world, democratic Europe, many people feel their rights and privacy have been abused by a country they hitherto have looked to as the bulwark of defense of those very same democratic rights. So we live in a Hobbesian world. We need our Locke, and we need our Voltaire, and our Payne, our Mill, and our Isaiah Berlin for the digital age. And so that's why what my call is for all of you tonight to think about how we proceed to address these issues so that in fact we can maintain liberal democracy 
uh, in, to, <coughs> with all of the challenges we have today. In Estonia, we have created our own kind of digital Lockean contract with the government as the guarantor of the rights and liberties of citizens based on consent and not fear. That has been our solution to the challenges in the digital world, a transparent system where the key to everything is a government that <coughs> is, a, is a government granted secure identity, but as I said, the, all the data, uh, your data belong to you. Uh, that's one direction, I think, but I think there are many other things that need to be done. If you can enforce the rule of law in the digital world, there is no, <coughs> there is no end of possibilities. Uh, we can do amazing things, and uh, we're only beginning to think of the good things we can do online if we, if we sort out the problems that have to do with privacy, data integrity, with rule of law. Um, and then I think we have a very bright future, but I think what we need to address right now is also the other side. How, how do we come to terms with the immense power granted to governments, but all kinds of other people today with the digital revolution. And so that I hope we think about these things and I hope that NDI comes up with some solutions and <laughs> we'll be working on it in Estonia, trying to develop some things and we hope we can work together with NDI on these issues. But I, I'll say again, it's, it, the issues are more complex than people have figured out. We're only, most of the world's only been uh, exposed to these issues since June but they've been around for a while and they will be around for a long time. So thank you very much. President Ilves, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to uh, give you this opportunity to welcome to you to begin your dinner. Um, I have already been remiss and messed up on my duties. I think I was the one that had the responsibility to warn you that Secretary, uh, Ambassador Power was late. Thank you very much, Secretary Albright, for stepping in. Um, I have two things to say. One is that I normally ban gadgets at dinner, but my children aren't here, so I'm going to break the rule. Please do tweet about the occasion. This is a technology evening. We would love to have the word spread. The second is that there are only 500 raffle tickets for that very sexy car outside. A hundred have been sold. You still have a chance to win it, and during dinner you will have an opportunity to buy raffle tickets. Please do to support NDI's 30th anniversary. Enjoy your dinner. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Caddy Kay. Thank you very much. I've just been told that my job is really um, to get people to be quiet. Uh, since I have four children, I'm pretty good at being strict, so I would like you all to give your, us your attention just for a little bit. I'm going to welcome back onto the stage Secretary Albright, who will then introduce us all to Ambassador Power. Thank you. Thank you, Caddy. Um, at um, NDR, we're determined to make the best of the opportunities that technology has created. But we also know that not even the most advanced information tools can meet all the challenges of governing in the modern era. We have to also develop strategies based on the right mix of interest and ideals. And for that, we require leadership, and I'm delighted to have the assignment this evening of introducing someone who is injecting a healthy dose of moral vision into U.S. foreign policy. She also happens to be someone with whom I share a few personal attributes. Ambassador Samantha Power and I are both immigrants who wanted very much when young to blend in as Americans. We have both served as United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, she is now sleeping in the same bed that I did, um, in the wonderful apartment there. We are both ardent supporters of the National Democratic Institute and its sister organizations, and we're both known for our shy and retiring natures. Um, and we both tweet. Uh, it's fair to say that Ambassador Power is more comfortable with the new technologies than I am. After all, she is not much older than NDI. 
While I was born, at least in the minds of my students, about halfway between the invention of the iPhone and the discovery of fire. Uh, when you first meet Samantha Power, you're likely to think that she's quite nice, because ordinarily she is. But if you are a dictator, a bigot, a human rights abuser, or a persecutor of civil society, you will quickly realize that this woman can be a pain in the neck. When in college and headed for a career in sports broadcasting, she was stopped cold by the televised image of a young man standing in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square. The tableau made her think, what is this all about? How is it possible for a person who represents the aspiration of millions to be so totally alone? Why are so many people forced to risk their lives for freedoms that we take for granted? Seeking answers, she headed after graduation to the Balkans, where she reported on the many horrors of ethnic cleansing, including mass rape. Later, she wrote a Pulitzer Prize-winning book about genocide, created a human rights organization, and gave advice on foreign policy to a young senator from Illinois who proved to be a very quick learner. In the White House, she helped launch an atrocities prevention board and served as a tireless advocate for democracy and human rights. And last August, she was confirmed as United Nations ambassador, having breezed through the Senate with miracle of miracles, strong bipartisan support. In New York, she has established herself as a human whirlwind, going head to head with the Russians on Syria, calling for an independent investigation of Oswaldo Paya's death, seeking votes from Congress on the Disabilities Convention, raising an alarm about violence in the Central African Republic, all seemingly before breakfast on a typical day. I have the feeling that Ambassador Power has just begun to make her presence felt on behalf of the principles and values that have brought us together tonight and for which NDI has been battling for the past 30 years. Please join me in welcoming America's permanent representative to the United Nations and my very, very good friend, Ambassador Samantha Power. One difference between us. I hope it's the only one. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Madam Secretary, and uh, greetings to everyone. I have always loved birthday parties, and I'm very honored to be invited to yours. Before I begin, I'd like to uh, briefly mention my sadness, many of our sadness, at the passing of our wonderful friend, Rich Williamson, who was a tireless advocate on behalf of democracy. Even though Rich served on the board of IRI, one of NDI's sister organizations, I expect he would have agreed with my own assessment that over the past 30 years, few institutions have labored harder to build democratic solidarity than NDI. No individual has done more to move the democratic conversation from simplistic cliches to real world solutions than Ken Wallach and no public figure has done more to put democratic progress at the heart of the global agenda, not to mention at the heart of the US foreign policy agenda, than the incomparable Madeleine Albright. <clears throat> NDI's accomplishments are legion, but one in particular seems appropriate to recall tonight. In June 1997, NDI brought Catholic and Protestant leaders to Northern Ireland, from Northern Ireland to South Africa to consult with President Nelson Mandela and his colleagues about the challenge of reconciliation. Mandela shared insights about what to do when negotiations stalled. Upon returning to Northern Ireland, one participant called the meeting a turning point. Not a day goes by in our talks, he said, that a reference is not made to the South African experience. Within a year, real peace finally broke out in Northern Ireland. South Africa's Minister of Constitutional Development called it the first occasion in the history of conflict 
when a country in the Northern Hemisphere turned to the South for help. That's NDI. In the grand spirit of Mr. Mandela, I would like to focus my remarks this evening not on what has been achieved, but on the complex struggle that continues. For despite the gains, concern about the potential destabilizing impact of democracy and democratization is surging, especially in the Middle East where movements launched in democracy's name have been accompanied by political unrest, and in Syria, of course, by a horrific civil war. Thus, the question of what the United States should do to advance human rights and democracy is increasingly debated in the media, among foreign policy experts, and within an American public that is wary of the instability unleashed by the Arab Spring and weary after more than a decade of overseas entanglements. In light of these events, we who advocate democracy, we who believe in a US foreign policy that puts human rights and democracy at its center, must deal frankly with three concerns that we hear ever more often. The first is that free elections, at least in the Arab context, empower forces that are better at winning votes than at governing justly or effectively. For example, the argument runs, the recent political openings have made Arab societies less stable without really helping people to enjoy more freedom or more opportunity. The second concern is that even if we believed democracy would produce good outcomes, we outsiders, we Americans, lack the leverage to influence democratic transitions in a meaningful way. Thus, we should adjust our expert expectations downward and devote our energy and our resources elsewhere. And the third worry we hear is that Arab democracy, if it does come to fruition, will not truly benefit US interests because Arabs' objectives differ markedly from our own. I think these questions and concerns sound familiar. I see some nodding. Um, in addressing these concerns, let's start with the first question about whether it is democracy that fuels instability. In Libya, after 40 years in which Gaddafi banned even the most elementary forms of free expression, where civil society was banned and the penal code authorized the death penalty for advocating change, is it democracy that we should blame for the lawlessness we see today? In Egypt, after decades in which political power was concentrated in the hands of an elite few, where religious and political identities were suppressed, where pluralism was effectively banned, should we hold democracy accountable for the current polarization? In Syria, is it democracy that caused Assad to use scuds and sarin gas against civilians sleeping in their beds or that causes Al-Qaeda affiliated groups to behead civilians, aid workers, and journalists? And for people who sometimes sound nostalgic for dictatorship, would it have been tenable then at the beginning of the Arab Spring or is it tenable now for the United States to align ourselves with those who could only maintain power through bloodshed. The truth is, witnessing in the Middle East actually strengthens rather than weakens the case for more open government. The bloodshed today is a toxic outcome, not of too much democracy, but of it is an outcome of decades in which democracy was absent. When governing institutions are long controlled and twisted by a single group to cater to its own interests, that country's political system will inevitably be drained of flexibility. There will be no confidence that the losing side in one political confrontation will be given a chance to prevail in the next. Instead of mutual trust, what takes hold is generalized fear. Those without power fears, fear those who wield it. Those with power fear those who want it, and those in the middle fear the clash between the two. So to those who worry about the impact of democracy on stability, we must insist that they are looking in the wrong direction. Authoritarian rulers offer the counterfeit of stability, the illusion that all is well provided the jails are full and those at the top remain entrenched. What authoritarian, sorry, excuse me, the, what authoritarian rulers actually produce is precisely that structural instability that we have been witnessing when, as inevitably happens, 
Their iron grip is loosened and long suppressed desires and resentments are unleashed. This leads to the second concern about whether the United States can do much to help democratic transitions succeed. A decade or so ago, many were concerned that our leaders might be attempting too much. A combination of exalted rhetoric and the Iraq war caused some to believe, wrongly, that we plan to impose our own style of government throughout the region. Today, the perception exists, again wrongly, that the United States may be taking a sabbatical from democracy promotion. And there are some who believe this wouldn't be a bad idea because there's little effective that we can do. This view is erroneous on both counts. As Ambassador Rice made clear just last week, in the Middle East, but also around the world, the Obama administration has been a strong supporter of democratic institutions, consistently stressing the value of independent civil society and media, equality for women and minorities, and fundamental human rights. We are working to mobilize a multilateral response to the global crackdown on civil society, which is as urgent as anything happening in the world today. We've urged greater political openness and a willingness to accommodate opposing views in such countries, even as China and Russia, with whose governments we are engaged on complex security issues. The Middle East is no exception. In Iran, as we explore the potential for a diplomatic solution to the nuclear issue, we continue to press for the right of the Iranian people to express themselves freely, <laughs> including online and through social media, just as their leaders now do. In Egypt, we have withheld some forms of military assistance, an unprecedented step in our bilateral relationship because we honor the right of Egyptians, all Egyptians, to express their views peacefully. And in the case of Bahrain, we have underscored that long-term stability can only be achieved through national reconciliation and concrete reforms that bring together all parties, including the government and opposition. There too, we've backed up our words with concrete actions, including, again, withholding portions of our military assistance to press the government to engage in reforms. Inclusion, we have argued, not exclusion, paves the way for the kind of stability that lasts. And it is the responsibility of all sides to create a positive political atmosphere for dialogue and to denounce violence and sectarian tensions of all kinds. As to whether our efforts are having an impact, we must, of course, acknowledge that there are limits to our influence. But when and on what issue has the United States ever had unlimited influence? We know from our history that democracy is not exactly an instant breakfast. We should not be surprised, and we are not surprised, when disputes take place elsewhere over constitutions, political party laws, and the proper allocation of checks and balances. The kind of diplomatic commitment we are bringing to bear now in the Middle East has been consequential in other contexts. Robust US engagement proved critical in facilitating the peaceful referendum that created South Sudan, in encouraging peaceful elections earlier this year in Kenya, and in making possible the re-entry into political life of Aung San Suu Kyi and helping Burma start down the road to democratic transition. Domestic activists are leading campaigns for free and fair elections, for governments free of corruption, for fair and equal treatment under the law, and when they do, they continue to turn to the United States for financial support and for the political leadership they need to protect their space to operate. And where transitions have been accompanied by violence, we know that the tremendous upsurge in international peace building activities has helped to produce and secure democratic gains in, among other places, the Balkans, East Timor, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, and Mali. And already we have evidence that our efforts are making a difference in the Middle East. While the struggle to protect civil society freedoms in Egypt continues, as all of you know, the US and its partners have played an important role in ongoing efforts to keep harmful NGO legislation off the books. In Yemen, we worked with international partners to bring about the end of Saleh's rule and launch a process of political reconciliation and, and reform, including the national dialogue currently underway. Our public and private engagement in Bahrain supported the first ever independent fact-finding commission invited by any leader in the Arab world. And let us not forget Libya, where we intervene militarily with our allies to protect civilians 
from a brutal crackdown and where in recent weeks the Libyan people have come together to demand the disarmament of militias in Tripoli and Benghazi. It is obviously hard for any of us to look at recent events in the Middle East and North Africa and to not despair over the extremism and violence that outsiders cannot simply make disappear and that the citizens in these countries never bargained for when they brought their children dressed in their finest to tell their leaders that they too deserve dignity. But looking forward, I know that we will adapt, finding new ways of pressing those who repress and supporting those who advocate for change. We will take our lead from the innovators that you will soon hear from tonight. In addressing the third concern, it's true these changes may not always have direct or immediate benefits for the United States. Those of us who promote democracy and respect for human rights harbor no illusions. As change comes to the Arab world, it will express itself in ways that reflect Arab perceptions and hopes. Democracy will not bring about some magical convergence of opinions and interests, but it lays the foundation for open and inclusive debate in which new thinking is wel welcomed, old myths are scrutinized, and extreme ideas are weighed against practical solutions to the problems of domestic and international life. The United States may not always be comfortable with the specifics of such a conversation, but the process is one we will recognize, for it is how our own country evolved from its earliest beginnings to where we are today. And over time, our interests are served by these processes and the foundations that they create for more stable and more open societies. As we champion democracy, we never forget that America's support for freedom is the cornerstone of our foreign policy. And it's the key to our standing in the world. That we stand for something larger than ourselves is America's comparative advantage. It's what sets us apart from Moscow and from Beijing. And it is what validates our claim to lead and causes others to join with us in making the world more safe, more prosperous, and more just. So let me once again salute all of you for what you are doing to build and sustain democratic institutions. There is no more important job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ambassador Power, thank you very much um, for those thought-provoking and moving remarks this evening. Here's what we are going to do now. We're going to have a panel discussion. I'm going to invite all my panelists up onto the stage um, to come and join me. Do we have them? They are going to come from this way. I knew that. Um, we're going to have a discussion now up here. I hope my microphone is working and that it's not only the BBC that has technical problems. Join me up on the stage and I will introduce them. These are a group of people who are doing extraordinary things, using new technologies to improve the workings of our democracies, to improve the relationships between governments and citizens. And they have uh, tools at their disposal, tools that they are innovating, which having just spoken to them uh, behind stage for a while, I think you'll all be fascinated to hear about. I'm going to introduce them briefly and then ask each of them about to tell us a story and an example of what it is that they're doing and then we'll carry on with our discu discussion. Jennifer Palker is the founder of Code for America. She's Deputy Chief Technology Officer for the United States. Jorge Soto, Soto is the founder of Data4 and Director of Civic Innovation in the Office of the President of Mexico. January Makamba is Tanzania's Deputy Minister of Science, Communications and Technology and a member of the Tanzanian Parliament. Swati Ramanathan is the co-founder of Janagraha and Belabes Benkreda is the founder of Munathara Initiative. And I apologize in advance for messing up any names that I did. Um, let me start with this idea of how we can get governments to reach out to civilians more effectively. Governments often tend to be traditional and risk-averse institutions. So what can we do to get them to engage with new technologies, often which they don't understand, 
to make their citizens more involved. Jen, I'm going to start with you. Before you became deputy CTO at the White House, you founded something that you called Peace Corps for Geeks. You don't look like a geek. Um, Code for America. And for those of you who don't know what it is, Code for America places innov innovative teams of IT talent within city governments in order to help them engage with citizens in more friendly ways and help solve public relations problems that are going on in those cities. Jen, start with telling us a little bit about, you were telling me earlier about it, the work that you have done in a place, for example, like Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, where you have used specific new technologies to make government work more effectively. Right, uh, so we work with city governments. Um, we did a great project in Philadelphia um, where we asked um, citizens to text in their ideas um, for the general plan, the 2035 plan. Um, I was thinking, though, um, in terms of getting government to engage differently with citizens about a project that we did in New Orleans in our second year. Actually, it was the same year that the Philadelphia um, project took place. Um, they had a real problem there around blighted properties. As many of you know, um, Hurricane Katrina exacerbated a, a situation with a number of blighted properties. And of course, you're trying to fix these properties, but in the meantime, the citizens are advocating for certain <coughs> properties to be demolished or to, to be taken care of in different ways. Um, and the problem that the city government had is that they have um, information about the um, people who've called in about the properties, you know, reports, um, inspections. They have information about the hearings that are, gonna ha that are going to happen. All of these different bits of information are held in different spreadsheets or ledgers or databases around city government. So at no point could you stand in front of a property in New Orleans and know the status of that blighted property, what the city was actually doing about it. And you had these citizens who on their own time were putting together that information. They could advocate for what they wanted to have happen in their neighborhood, but it was an incredibly laborious process. And every month you would have these um, people show up at these blight status meetings where they would talk about you know, various properties in the city that needed to be dealt with. And they were very contentious meetings. I always describe them as sort of, um, you know, defensive city government and an angry and frustrated populace. We had these fellows go down there. They thought that this was probably a three-year, $30 million IT project. These 20-something-year-old developers came down there, developers and data people and designers, went down there, um, um, four of them, for a couple of months. And they, put, they took all that data and put it together in a lovely, beautiful interface and they offered it to the citizens. And the first time they rolled it out at this blight status meeting, and everyone could be on the same page about what was going on with these blighted properties, what they told us was that it changed the conversation. You didn't have this contention anymore. You actually had the citizens in the city working together to try to figure out what to do about the properties. And I think the, the, the story there really is that I don't think public servants want to be um, shouted out. I don't think they want to be um, always on the defensive. They really do want to work with citizens. And if you give them those tools, and you can literally put citizens and city on the same page using technology, you can change that conversation. Jorge, you have done something similar to Jen. You've had a similar career path working in startups um, with using data uh, provided by government. Uh, you were then tapped, you were living in California, and you were tapped by the new government of Mexico, uh, President Peña Nieto, to come down and do something similar to Jen, but on a national scale. How, what are you doing and how are you doing it? Well, um, as you said, my, my career uh, has been as, a, as an entrepreneur, as an activist, and now working for the government. And in all these several stages, I've been learning a lot how can we interact with citizens and also how can we uh, regain trust from the government. Uh, one example uh, that we worked a lot, uh, that we worked in a long time ago, a couple of years ago, it was in the north of Mexico. I, I believe that technology is shaped by society, but also the use of technology is defined by the context of how this society lives. And as you know, in Mexico, we are living in a lot of uh, security problems. So in the north of Mexico, um, people are using Twitter to connect with, with, with each other, and they are trusting each other much better than than traditional media outlets or the government. So they're using particular hashtags to uh, alert about, uh, about disasters, or about uh, gunfights, about what's going on in the city. So they're not using texting We're so not much. using texting uh, because we understood that texting in Mexico, it's a little bit more expensive than in, the, in other countries. But Twitter 
uh, my parents, they are 65 year olds, and they are, they are creating their Twitter accounts because they know that searching for a particular hashtag, they will be able to know if they can go to the movies or go out of the movies back, back home. So Whether there's some security problem in the street outside. Whether there's a gunfight or something. So we created this thing called the, the, the Center for Citizen Integration. That what it does is it's, it's, a, it's an institution, a non-profit institution that validates all those reports on Twitter or that conversation on Twitter and forwards it, forwards it to the government, to the official institutions to try to tackle and to actually to solve the problems. So far in a year and a half we have received and validated around 65,000 reports and uh, this is just particularly in the north, northeast of Mexico. But other kind of projects, for example, uh, this is for, with the citizens, but the geeks, I'm, a, I'm definitely a geek. So uh, with the geeks, there, there was, there was, a, there was uh, in March this year, uh, uh, the Mexican Congress, they, it was leaked that they approved a contract, a $10 million contract to develop an iPhone app. And it's a bit expensive if you know about technology. And uh, so what we did, instead of just angry tweeting about what's going on, we decided to, 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 to talk to the old civic hacker community and tell them, is someone willing to do the same app for $1,000 and an iPad? And we received 175,000 uh, responses of the civic hackers and five apps that were completed in, 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 in open source code in five, in five days, in a week. And we went to the Congress to present the five, the five, uh, the five apps and um, the, all the congressmen were there and, uh, and after the geeks, we presented their, their, their app. The, their, the, the, the leader of the Congress, he, he, took the stage, he took the stage and he said, you know what, after seeing what these guys have done in a week with $1,000, I believe that, um, that this, the contract was a little bit expensive. <laughs> so so we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna cancel it. I'm sure the people who had the contract loved you. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then the president hired me, so. <laughs> so yeah, and yeah, now I'm working for the government, uh, and I know that governments, mainly Latin America, they can be uh, corrupted or inefficient, but also the best governments have uh, helped their citizens to live richer and safer and healthier lives and, and, and build on that capabilities. What, what I think is interesting about all of the people up on this stage, they all come from different areas of the world, and they are all using technology in slightly different ways, in the ways that suit the citizens and the culture of their country. Minister McKember, you are um, Deputy Minister for Science Communications. You're also an elected official, and you've done something in Tanzania that is totally new, reaching out to your citizens, not by Twitter and to your electorate, by using, taking cell phone numbers from people and actually SMSing and texting them. Yes, uh, when I was running for parliament, uh, one of the uh, issues that uh, people mentioned uh, as a problem is that they elect leaders, the MPs, and uh, immediately they become inaccessible. Um, and uh, People might say that here too. <laughs> so uh, what I learned uh, is that uh, people use uh, SMSs a lot uh, in their daily uh, interactions. And uh, uh, as part of my campaign strategy, I was collecting the phone numbers so that I can SMS people, come vote, vote for me. Uh, so it became uh, easier and became no-brainer uh, when I was elected. I set up uh, a platform, a system, uh, with a special number uh, in which uh, people can uh, uh, reach me at any time uh, of the day if there's an, any issue. After this dinner, I'll go in, uh, and log in into a system which I have and read messages that has been sent uh, over the past uh, 12 hours, the last time I checked. How many do you expect there would be during uh, the course 40, of an edit? Probably 40. And you want uh, to reply to each of them? Uh, yes, or I forward them uh, to particular people who are concerned. Let's say I'll find a message uh, where a bridge has been swept away uh, by rain, and we have a district engineer. Uh, so I would uh, forward that message or call and sometimes these messages are real time, uh, that there's a particular problem, there's a fire in the village, and people are frantically sending messages. And obviously, I can't do anything with that fire, but what I do is uh, I call uh, people who are on the scene, and they put me on loudspeaker. So sometimes people, uh, they know that you can't do something at that particular time, but they show off concern, care, accessibility uh, helps them to feel empowered, that they can access their leader, and their leader is listening, and uh, is probably going to do something about it. So uh, it has proved quite useful for me, uh, because And I useful, presumably, for the citizens 
and well, useful for you politically, but useful for the citizens to feel they have somebody who can actually, they can actually effective, not call, but text to get a response. Absolutely, and uh, some messages that can be very nasty uh, as well. <laughs> uh, that, uh, look, you know, what are you doing? We don't see you know, anything since you got elected and you try to uh, educate and explain uh, you know, uh, what you've been trying to do. So, so uh, it has been uh, quite useful. Now, I'm, I'm right, aren't I, in thinking, January, that you are, you're texting in, in Swahili or in English? Yes, uh, in Swahili. Uh, that's the common and, language. And it's just one language? One language. Uh, that's the unique feature of Tanzania, where we have uh, a language that is used by all irrespective of whether or not you've gone to school. It's not a colonial language. Uh, okay, th language. Which leads me to Swati Ramanathan, who uh, has come to us, flown in this evening for us from India. Swati, thank you very much for, for joining us and for flying such a long way. You were mentioning earlier, and again, this is the issue of different cultures and different countries having different languages, but again, trying to use technology to get to people, because you are dealing with multiple languages. So the option that is available to January is not an option that is available to you. Yes, that's right. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me here. We are, I'm honored to be here on behalf of Janagraha and my online team, which is uh, extraordinary. But uh, let me give you an example of some of the data stuff that uh, we deal with. You know, in government, I mean, I, I was talking to Ellen Miller earlier, and we would, she was talking about how data, when it's placed, has to be placed fully. And, uh, and I was thinking, you know, uh, I was thinking about the line, in God you trust, everybody else bring data to the table. And, you know, our governments wouldn't be able to fulfill that because in India, one of the biggest challenges is that where's the data? It's not that government doesn't want to give it to us. I mean, I'm sure it would come to that when they had it, but they themselves don't have it. So one of the online properties that uh, we have, and, and first to answer to your question, yes, one of the biggest struggles that we have is the penetration of internet and the literacy levels, that not everybody is literate, uh, and the multiplicity of languages that we have. So there, these are restrictions that we have. However, having said that, I mean, the scale and the size of our population, folks, we are about 150 million that have internet penetration, so that's, and that's a very small percentage, but uh, the mobile telephony is 700 million people. The size of the population in our country is 1.2 billion people. And uh, you know, our urban population is about 31% at this point where we are transitioning. Uh, the largest amount of corruption that takes place is you know, both in rural and in urban, but urban especially is very, for not the big ticket ones, what we call wholesale corruption, but the smaller things that impact our day-to-day -to -day life and interactions with government services such as driver's licenses, birth and death certificates, passports, every one of these is ridden with an instance of graft, you know, money has to exchange hands. But we weren't even able to scope the size of this kind of problem. And so I paid a bribe.com was the first, you know, largest repository of uh, bribe instances on this retail corruption uh, so actually, in the tell, country. Tell us, describe how I paid a bribe.com actually works. So ipaidabribe.com is the first time it works as a confessional, because I'm so irritated that I had this indignity of having been forced to pay a bribe. And it's great that I have a site. So it's non-moralistic. It doesn't you know, say that, oh, you bad person, you've paid a bribe or any of that. But at least you come and report it. And if you look at the instances of reports that have come in, 22,000, uh, Caddy, 22,000 bribe instances that have been reported. And Over the, the total amount is $10 million. In dollar terms, it's USD 10 million. That works out to $450 per bribe. And if you look at the urban population, just per household, if you take conservative estimates and say each household per annum pays one bribe, that works out on an annual basis on just petty corruption of $3 billion. I mean, and this is, you know, and there's no data on this. So this has become a great way of doing this. What we have done is we've started introducing the ability for people who are reporting to say, I want you to send the bribe, you know, this story of mine to the concerned department, the concerned citizen. And what has happened is 40% of them are actually saying yes. This is a higher bar of courage that is required out of citizens because now you can no longer be anonymous. You have to give your personal data because now there's investigation that's followed up. But look at what happens in a country where there is such a deficit of trust. When government responds with concrete action, with measurable action, 
the surge of hope that comes in is incredible. It's extraordinary. So we have something called the Unique Identification Code, uh, which has started. There's an authority which has started in India. We had a report where the gentleman said, I had to pay a bribe for my father and me to you know, get this thing. We sent this report, and he said, please share this with the concerned authority. Within 40 years, the UIDA, the authority of there, actually blacklisted the operator and then is following up with criminal proceedings. Now, the euphoria that comes in and the hope that comes in when people see their governments responding is extraordinary. And progressive departments with progressive cities, when they start doing this, that's when it's like rainwater harvesting. You know, hope kind of actually begins to work. And technology, without technology, we couldn't have done this. So, Swati, thank you. Very much. Great story. <laughs> Bella, we were, talk we were hearing from Ambassador Power earlier um, about the transition problems in the Middle East. This is the area of the world uh, that you are working in, and you have developed a debate platform to get young people in the Middle East, the very people who were leading the call for change a couple of years ago, uh, to talk about things that they find difficult, to get women to talk, to um, get young people to give alternative perspectives. How are you doing that? Well, we're a completely open debate platform. Anybody can take part by uploading a video of up to nine, 99 seconds on our platform. And then we have an online sort of crowdsourcing process where the broader public gets to vote on these contributions. And the winners of these online debates are invited to take part on an equal footing on primetime television debates with either elected leaders or other opinion leaders, uh, you know, like uh, academics and, and journalists and so on. Um, but I, I think the, the best way to illustrate this is, is to use a, an example relevant to the United States. Imagine you had a debate about an issue of major contention in this country. President Ilves mentioned earlier uh, gun control. But instead of the usual opinion leaders and policymakers, like, let's say, Nancy Pelosi and Rand Paul, they would be joined by perfectly unknown youth from America, a girl from Kansas of 20 years and a boy from Alabama of 22 years. So, and they've been voted to get there by the American people through an online platform. So can you imagine what this would do in to the perception, not only of the youth who are participating, but also their peers who are watching them on television? Now imagine that we're doing this in the Arab world, where opinion leaders are almost invariably men between the ages of 50 and 80, where the women and youth of the region are tragically excluded from the public sphere. So this is obviously very inspiring, and we've seen some, some great examples of, of youth who are so articulate and came out as sort of like the stars of these debates and went on to do great things. And, and we saw so many young people involved in the leadership, really, of the Arab Spring. They were the people who got, we saw brought out onto the streets of Tunisia, where you operate from, um, through social media. As, is it the same people that are now talking in these open debates and what are they asking for and how are their messages being received by those older people who are in leadership? Surprise. I mean, people are surprised when they actually see for the first time in their lives youth debate on television. They're very surprised. And I think, again, this is very important. It was youth who drove the change a couple of years ago and yet they're being tragically left out of the conversation about the future of their countries these days. So it, it, the importance of the youth participation and marginalized communities and women, those groups who are so underrepresented, cannot be overstated. But what, what, the skill with which they use social media to drive those revolutions, why is that same use of social media not happening now to get the kind of involvement in the government process that you're trying to initiate? It, it is happening. But there is intense polarization. And social media is actually being used to foster that polarization because it offers opportunities to, cut, to customize your own public sphere. You follow the people you agree with. You read the articles that you know you're going to like. That is, a, that is a problem. So it really is also, aside from the fact that technology can help us foster uh, more participation, it's also about a culture of seeing the opportunity in opposing views and engaging with those that you disagree with as an opportunity for new ideas to thrive and opportunities for the national discourse to develop and evolve. We have a few more minutes and I want to ask each of you one question um, briefly, which is you have an audience here 
of several hundred people who are committed to the idea of democracy around the world and the promotion of the idea of democracy around the world. Um, let me start with you, Jen. If you could ask them to do one thing tomorrow morning when they get back slightly bleary-eyed to their desks, what would it be? <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think for us it would be to promote the notion that we can be involved not just at the political level, but at the governmental and the bureaucratic level, and to push that out to young people. I think they've been invited into the political discourse. Um, they know that they can help get, uh, change the conversation and get people elected. They also need to know that when it comes to the day-to-day -day of governing, they have a role there too. Jorge? Um, <clears throat> I would say, um, well, first of all, uh, Trust the geeks, and second of all, <laughs> very yes. And second of all, uh, I think institutions cannot be cannot be imposed from the top. I think institutions are built from the bottom up, one interaction at a time. January. I think that it's important uh, to champion the idea of uh, universal coverage of. Uh, uh, mobile access. Let's just uh, quickly, you bring up a very good point and I meant to bring it up earlier. In each of your countries, what is the, per the percentage rate of mobile coverage? January, you have the floor. What is it? Uh, about 60. 60, 60. 60% yes. in Tanzania. Penetration. Yeah. Penetration. Yeah. Jorge in Mexico? Uh, mobile is around 80% and internet is around 40 Jen, you have had some surprising figures. You mentioned to me Philadelphia earlier. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, in Philadelphia, I think 60% of households have um, broadband access, and... 60% um, in Philadelphia. Also, yeah, we, we have some, many of the same problems. Surprisingly low. And uh, it's a higher number for, um, for mobile phones, but it's a low number for smartphones in Philadelphia, and so we need to reach people through text messaging. Swati in India? Um, I'm going to give you the numbers because I keep wanting to stagger you with the numbers, you know, the, the size of the population. It's 150 with access, 150 million with the access to internet, and 700 million with access to mobile telephony. Which is a percentage is what of India's population? The, the total population of India is 1.2 billion people. So you're looking at about 70%. You're looking access. at about less than 10% on, um, on internet, about 10% right. on internet. But in terms of mobile access, and mobile very is, high. A, is a, a prox between 65 to 70%. And, and Bella Bess, I'm, I'm assuming in the Middle East that mobile access is very high. But it's, it's very, it de really depends. You know, we work across the entire Arab world, and we have countries where it's in the lower tens uh, and all the way up to the, the mid 70s in some of the Arabian Gulf countries. So it's, it's really diverse. Uh, I know Algeria, for example, last, last figure I read was 16%, uh, which is really quite tragic for a country of almost 40 million people, which is where my parents are from. Uh, but again, it goes like in places like Qatar, it can go, uh, I think, uh, in the early 70s to mid 70s. January, forgive me, it, it is Christmas and it is your wish that you'd like to ask from these people so that one thing that they could do or, or understand for your initiative. Yeah, precisely, that uh, uh, access mobile is such empowering in some of our countries uh, because it includes uh, financial inclusion, people use uh, a mobile phone to transfer money, but also democratic inclusion as well. Uh, so uh, we should not let this thing to be of business. Uh, all of us can work together and think through how can we make uh, some of our country uh, attain universal coverage. Um, and uh, also it's important to understand that uh, uh, democracy uh, and legitimacy of leaders who are elected will always be contested uh, and public debates in some of our countries uh, sometimes take a form of an election campaign and it's futile for a political leader to say that uh, the election is over, I've won, so uh, there should not be a debate on a particular public policy. Uh, that will continue to happen and we should get used to it and that uh, people who are better equipped to use some of these tools will continue to win uh, uh, debate and public policy. Swati, you have a Christmas wish. Well, I would, I would ask Jack to actually help us innovate on uh, <laughs> specifically him on a financial inclusion because we are running the largest urban uh, microfinance institution which we hope will become a bank pretty soon. But it, uh, it, you know, it actually addresses the problems of two million already, and we have a hundred branches across the country. But I think the technology is going to be a game changer in how financial inclusion takes place. And I'd uh, love for 
you know, innovation and, and helping us think through prepaid cards, mobile, all of that. So, Benavis. Well, you know, our initiative is really based on the idea of uh, collaborating with as many people as possible on working towards new ideas. So I would encourage everybody to go to our website, look at some of the programs we're running. There are many ways of supporting us. And we'd love to enter the conversation with everybody. Jen Palka, Jorge Soto, Janir Makamba, Swati Ramanathan, Balabes, Ben Crater. Thank you all very much for joining me up here. Thank you, all of you. And I have one more thing to say, which is I think that fiat is still out there. So I'm going to make a final pitch because we have kept the raffle ticket buying open. And if you would like to, you still have a few more minutes to buy the raffle ticket uh, before we have the next honoree. I am going to invite um, Secretary Albright back up here to introduce the next part of the program. Secretary Albright. Hello, everybody. Me again. Uh, who would have thought in uh, 2006 that a new short messaging service used primarily by techies would become so influential that a 75-something former Secretary of State would feel compelled to use it? Some of my friends think of me as a twit. But the truth is that you can now follow me on Twitter, at, at Madeline. Twitter numbers are, uh, alone are impressive. 500 million registered users sending over 300 million twits per day. 120 tweets, twits, tweets, tweet, tweety twits. Uh, 125 heads of state are active tweeters. I think this is the only dinner I've been to where it's perfectly acceptable for everybody to be tweeting and uh, being on their various methods of communication. Uh, yet the numbers don't do justice to the implications of Twitter for democracy. As I noted earlier, the term Twitter revolution has been applied to democratic uprisings from Moldova to the Arab world. Twitter serves as a source of news and information and increases the speed by which information travels. Unlike television and radio, Twitter empowers individuals themselves to become the observers and reporters, thereby fueling transparency and accountability. And it provides unparalleled opportunities for contact between political leaders and their constituents between networks of citizens. These are just a few of Twitter's impacts on democracy, but to be honest, this is a story that still has, uh, that is in the process of being written and needs to continue to do so. We're privileged tonight to hear from Jack Dorsey, a co-founder and chairman of Twitter. Original St. Louis, Jack's fascination with urban transit, he just told me he was a dispatcher, led him to Manhattan where he programmed real-time messaging services for couriers, taxis, and emergency vehicles. Through his work, Jack witnessed thousands of drivers constantly updating their location and activity, inspiring the idea behind Twitter. Jack is also the co-founder and CEO of Square, a rapidly growing mobile payments technology company that is changing the landscape for small businesses and for civic startups and civil society organizations. I saw firsthand the incredible work Jack is doing at Square when I visited their offices in April. I did get run over by a uh, mobile full-size robot, um, but at the same time I also saw easily how Square technology can be used to engage in everyday commerce, and it's a potential to transform the lives of small businessmen and women in communities across the world. Many of you have heard me speak about the fact that political and economic development go together. Democracy has to deliver because people want to vote and eat, and I think that having that economic development side uh, understood is very important. And so tonight, we honor Jack as a civic innovator 
as he embodies the entrepreneurial spirit and bold vision of this amazing group of individuals. So, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Jack Dorsey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Albright, and uh, thank you, NDI, for 30 years of work to spread democracy and encourage civic participation all around the world. It's humbling to be in the presence of so many wonderful thinkers and leaders, and it's an honor to be able to accept this award on behalf of all the work that we've done at Twitter and, and at Square. I'm a man of very, very few characters, um, 140 <laughs> characters, even fewer words, and almost no speeches. So I'm going to keep this brief, and I'm going to focus on some of my observations around technology and its role in our world. We often put technology on a pedestal, and when we do, we in turn make it unapproachable. Sometimes it's even a little bit scary to people. How many times have you heard or even found yourself saying, I'm not good with technology. I don't understand it. I don't know how to use it. We use the word technology so frequently today that it loses all of its meaning. It's time we demystify the word technology and recognize it for what it is. It's a tool and nothing more. A basic tool saves effort and gives time back to people. Saves effort and gives time back to people. A good tool gives purpose to anyone who picks it up. And a great tool inspires a sense of joy and wonder with every use. Marshall McLuhan once said, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. The tools we build are a pure reflection of what we value as a civilization. If we look at the tools we are building today, and more importantly, how people use these tools, we see a few undeniable expectations of a rapidly growing population. An expectation of equal participation. An expectation of the global free flow of information and an expectation that it's all available immediately. And today, these are not seen just as expectations. These are seen as fundamental rights. Why? Because people thirst for connection with each other. It's deep within every one of our souls. As the world gets bigger and more complex, we all cry out for it to feel smaller, simpler, and more human. We shape the world we live in every single day through the tools that we create and we use. We paint that picture every single day with the brush of technology. At Twitter, our canvas is communication. At Square, our canvas is commerce. We are tool makers. That's all we are, tool makers. And we have high expectations for the use of our tools. We expect Twitter to help give people a global voice. Why? So a child born in a village like Vesmo can use this tool to fulfill the right to an honest government that provides its opportunities limited only by their ambitions and honors human rights. We expect Square to give people purposeful work. Why? So a businesswoman in Memphis, Monrovia, Manila, or Mexico City can use this tool to fulfill the right to freely participate in a global marketplace, sell the product she proudly makes, and put her family and local community on the road to e economic equality. I wanted to leave you all with one of the greatest tools that I've found and discovered and use on a daily basis in my life. It's a simple question. It's why. It's only three characters. Three characters. You've 
plenty of room to answer with 140. Why is the easiest question to ask? And it's the hardest one to answer. It's why children ask it all the time and adults get frustrated. But those who have the patience to stick with it, to use it as a tool to go deeper, they find something essential. And they find something so essential that it binds every single person on this planet. The more we encourage ourselves and others to ask why, the better and more empowering our tools and our answers are going to be. The science fiction author named William Gibson, how many of you have read William Gibson? He once said that he once said something that inspires me every single day, and it's one of the principles we use to guide our companies. He said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Which is a very, very powerful statement. <clears throat> and what that means is that the future is already here in this room. It's already here in every single one of your heads. And your job, our job walking out of this room, is to distribute it evenly. If we want to see democracy in the world, if we want immediate participation for all people, we have to distribute that. We have to distribute that future. It's already here. It's in this room. It's in every single one of the people that join our companies, every single one of the people in a generation to come. And it's up to us to make sure that we listen and that we empower by giving people better tools to continue to ask that most important question, which is why. Our job is to relentlessly answer the question why and to distribute that answer evenly around the world. Thank you all very much. It's an honor to be here. We are coming towards the end of this incredible evening, and it really leads me to repeat a great thank you to Ken Wallach and to Sherry Bryan, who have done such an amazing job with NDI, and Sherry particularly for having put this dinner together, and to Steve Wisnett, and to the staff of the National Democratic Institute, without whom nothing could happen. Uh, uh, Um, I would like to now take time to introduce my dear friend and fellow NDI board member and the only senator to serve twice as majority and minority leader in the United States Senate, Tom Daschle. Um, Tom serves as vice chair of the National Democratic Institute, but he has not confined himself to just the Institute's boardroom. Instead, he has traveled throughout the world to share his experiences as an elected leader. And I have seen firsthand how politicians in other countries take his counsel and advice very seriously. He hasn't just gone to easy places. He has traveled all over and has, I think, carried the message of democracy in the most dedicated and amazing way. He has brought NDI uh, the same kind of things that he stood for in Congress, a deep and abiding commitment to democratic politics, to public service, and using the institution of government to better the lives of citizens. And most importantly, Tom exemplifies the values of tolerance, compromise, and bipartisanship and I can testify to the fact that he's just a terrific traveling companion. Um, and we have gone to many places together and I'm very proud to serve with him. And that's why NDI decided to launch a new program in his name, the Tom Daschle Leadership Initiative. The campaign will allow NDI to expand our efforts to support a new generation of democratic political leaders around the world who will embrace the innovation that we have recognized tonight. And so please help me welcome our very great leader, Senator Tom Daschle.
Thank you very much, Madeline. Thank you very much. Thank you for your extraordinary leadership and uh, for that warm and generous introduction. I uh, want to thank all of you. Uh, the certificates for I Survived the 30th Anniversary Dinner are available just as you walk out the door. And I know you'll each want one. They're signed by both of us, and you'll appreciate that as a, as a memento for the evening. But I, let me uh, thank my wife, Linda, and some very, very special friends who have come, in some cases, long distances to be here tonight. It means a lot to me that my special friends are here, and, and uh, our success tonight, in part, is because of their presence. And like Madeline did and Ken, I, I want to thank our staff. Uh, they don't get the kind of attention and the expressions of gratitude that they deserve, not only the ones who helped us with the dinner tonight, but all around the world. One of the things that we all marvel at as we travel is just the enormous professionalism, dedication, commitment that they show day in and day out. And that level of professionalism is something you so rarely see with the consistency that we see it as NDI, and so we're very grateful to them as well. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm flattered and I'm honored and somewhat uncomfortable with this new initiative, but I, like many of you, by the mission of NDI, the realization that we have had one focus now for three decades and that focus is very simply to empower people to be able to govern themselves more effectively. That's what we try to do. And we saw vivid examples of that tonight. We saw it with these young leaders. We saw it with an amazing president. Leadership in democracy is not easy these days. But we saw reflections of tolerance and respect for the rule of law and participation and leadership. That's what we saw tonight. And that's what this organization's all about. And so as we mark this important moment, we all recognize that the credibility of democracy really comes down to the capacity of a government to improve the lives of the people, to improve their lives in security contexts, in education, in healthcare, in infrastructure, and basically in jobs. And now with our capacity through technology, and because we put the emphasis on the role of women that we do, and the importance that we have shown in trying to improve the strength of these institutions, this leadership initiative is dedicated to help these governments and these democracies just do it even better. We've seen a lot in 30 years. The end of the Cold War, the Arab Spring. We've seen transnational movements all over the world. And as I think back of all of that, I'm absolutely convinced that NDI is needed now more than ever. And maybe you got a little bit of a glimpse of that tonight. We need it more in the next 30 years than we need it in the last 30. And so we celebrate tonight, but we also recognize the importance of that future that Jack was just talking about. And of course, this week we celebrate an incredible leader in Nelson Mandela. We remember his eloquence. We remember when he said that his life represented a long walk to freedom. Well, tonight we dedicate ourselves to 30 more years, helping millions of people as they attempt their long walk to freedom, too. Thank you all very much. And good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, to help us choose the winner of the Fiat raffle, Please welcome Chrysler's Senior Vice President of External Affairs, Jody Trapasso, and member of the Board of Directors for NDI and Chrysler Group LLC, Rob Liberator.
I, I'm the latter introducee. I'm Rob Liberator. Very pleased to be with you. Wearing two hats tonight. My hat as a board member of NDI and the other hat as a board member of Chrysler. Uh, Chrysler began its engagement with NDI in the mid-90s, serving as a sponsor for a fabulous program that NDI does at every convention called the International Leadership Forum, where they take 600 international leaders and provide them the most spectacular orientation to, to the convention, to the American political system, and interaction with, uh, with our leaders of the Democratic Party. Uh, Chrysler understands that the work NDI does for civil society and effective governance is essential to a healthy world of commerce. So tonight it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the Senior Vice President of External Affairs from Chrysler, someone very responsible for the fact that Chrysler and Fiat are making this uh, gift to NDI tonight, and one of you is gonna drive home in a fabulous, sexy, little Fiat 500 Cabrio. <laughs> Jody? Well, thank you, Rob, and thank you, Senator Daschle. I think hopefully you all had a chance to take a look at the Fiat on your way in, and if you look at it, it's essentially a convertible. And I think given the fact that today was filled with snow and slush and sleet and cold, it takes people with some vision and some courage and some hope to buy a raffle ticket <laughs> for a convertible. And I, I think it's that same vision and hope and courage that's driven NDI to do remarkable things around the world and for 30 years to be a beacon for freedom and democracy and human dignity. So we're proud to be partners with NDI. We're proud of our long partnership and we're proud to be here tonight. We're also humbled that someone who's dedicated his public life to these values, Senator Tom Dash, who will pick tonight's winner of this, this beautiful car. <laughs> so we'll turn it over to, to Senator Dash. Tom, get the, get the one with the red dot, would you? That's the one that Linda put in. Okay, it's, I apologize if I get the name wrong, but Nazi <laughs> F. Qatari, Robert Sunday of Zeus. Okay, there we go. I guess we didn't get it wrong. Welcome. Congrats. This is a sign the women of Iran are going to be free and they're not going to wear that veil. Hello! I get a fear. Who sold me the ticket? Where's the gentleman? The gentleman who sold me the ticket, where is he? Did I tell you I'm buying the car and not buying a ticket? I bought the Fiat. I love it. Thank you. I love it. I will cherish it. I will drive it to Tehran. Thank you. Thank you. All of Tehran will drive Fiat. Thank you. Thank you. All the way. Every woman in Tehran will drive a Fiat. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you all very much for coming here this evening. It's really been a remarkable fun. Thank you all for your support of the National Democratic Institute. We will be around for another 30 years at least. Thank you.